Amen, amen. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you, choir. What a beautiful reminder that through all stages of our lives, from the beginning to the end, God is with us. Jesus is there. Thank you so much. Well, it's good to be here at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church today. Well, I should say it's good to be back here. This is my third time to have the honor and privilege of coming to be here with you, except the last time, two times, we weren't meeting here. We were in a building that no longer exists. I drove up this morning. I can't tell you how impressed I was with what you're doing and the efforts you are making and obviously the planning that has been done to build this new facility that no doubt will be a tool used in this community for generations to come. You will once again have a permanent presence in this community pointing people to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ and you're to be commended for that. So it's great to be here today. I was excited when your pastor, um, Bill, uh, contacted me and asked me to come to be here on this day. Well, turn your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at one verse there, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, focusing there on the 10th verse. And here we have the Apostle Paul writing to the believers there in Ephesus, a very familiar passage to many of you. And here is what Paul writes in the 10th verse of the second chapter. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Oh, Father, thank you so much for the chance to come and to, to gather with other believers, to praise you, to worship you, and to... It's just enjoy your presence. Oh, Father, I pray that you would take the reading and the proclamation of your word, that you would bless it so that our lives might be changed to be more like Jesus. And we offer this prayer in his name. Amen. Amen. What am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do now? Oh, I don't mean now that I've finished high school and gone off to college. I don't mean now that I've graduated and started my career. I don't mean now that I've gotten married and have some children. Oh, I don't mean now that I've retired and supposedly get to do more of the things that I want to do. No, no, no. What I mean is, what am I supposed to do now that I'm saved? Now that I'm a believer, now that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ... What am I supposed to do now? You see, I think it's a very important question this morning, church, because a lot of you, I would probably say the majority of you here in this room are kind of like me, and that is you're going to spend more of your life saved than lost. You see, when I was uh, eight years old at the Parkway Baptist Church in Natchez, Mississippi, I was sitting about right there, and it was a revival service on a Tuesday night. Dr. John Barnes was preaching, and I knew that I was a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. I was eight, but I'd heard the gospel all my life. I'd grown up in church from the time I was in a cradle roll. But it was on that night, eight years old, that I walked down the aisle, confessed my faith in Jesus Christ, repented of my sins, and I became a Christian. Now, in a few months... In a few months, I'm going to turn 50. So I'm not good in math, but just take the difference there, right? I was 8, I'm about to be 50. That's 42 years that have passed since I became a follower of Jesus Christ. So here's the question. What was I supposed to have been doing for these last 42 years? Just sitting around existing in a state of salvation? Just sitting around waiting for God to call me home? Was I supposed to be doing anything for these last 42 years, did God and does God have a plan for my life as a believer? Uh, and, and you see, this is, this is huge, Christian, and here's why for us, those of us who are kind of evangelical Christians, particularly Southern Baptists, we place a lot of emphasis on that moment of salvation, okay? And we should. That's right. We ought to, because otherwise you're still lost, right? If you don't get saved, you're still lost. You're still destined for hell. You're still lost in your sin and trespasses, Okay. We put a lot of emphasis on that moment of salvation. But what happens after that? What do we do for the rest of our lives? Does God have anything for us to do? I want you to know the answer to this question is a resounding yes. Absolutely. God has something for us to do. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. You know what that means? That means i got a reason to get out of bed tomorrow. 
I got something to do tomorrow. I got something that counts, something that's important, something that is significant, and something that matters. Why? Because it comes from God. God has something for Stan Buckley to do with the rest of his life other than just taking up space and breathing good air. And you know what? Here's the great news. He's got something for you too. Did you know it? For every one of us. And when we understand that, when we finally grasp that, i got to tell you something. It changes everything. And, and I came here today to tell you this. Honestly, I, I had another sermon I was going to preach. You know, and it's a good sermon. It's just right out of the Bible, all that. But I thought, no, 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 no. I'm going to be here this morning. Larger crowd in the morning, right? Okay. And, and so I know how that works. And so i got to tell you all this. I'm glad you're here. I've got to share this with you because we're in the same boat. We're still here. We're still alive, right? And we don't need to be wasting this time that God's given us. So what do we do then? How do we know what we're supposed to do? It's right here. We just read it. Ephesians 2, chapter 10. Here it is. We read it. What is it? God created us what? In Christ Jesus, here it is, to do good works. Wait a minute. Isn't it more complicated? Isn't it more theologically deep? No, no, no. That's it. You and I have been created by God to do good works. Now, before anybody thinks I'm a heretic, I'm not, okay? I went to seminary. I understand theology. I know we're not saved by good works. Some of you, come on, you're getting worried about me, right? I know we're not saved by good works. In fact, a couple of verses before that, Paul says specifically that we're not saved by good works, right? He says we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, so nobody can go around bragging about it. That's what he says. Okay, but here's the key. Once we have been saved by grace through faith, God didn't just call us to sit around looking at each other, right? Once we have been saved by grace through faith, now we have something to do, and that something is good works. Now, for our benefit, no, no, no. For the glory of God and for the benefit of others. Amen. We've been saved for good works, for the glory of God, and for the benefit of others. Now, to me, that kind of begs the question then. If I've been saved by grace through faith, and now I'm to do good works. What's included in that category of good works? Okay? I need to know what that is because the Bible says that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So what's included? Well, here's the deal. There could be an infinite list of things included in this category of good works. But I think we're safe to say that the vast, overwhelming majority of things that would be included in good works will involve people. Okay? Because here, here's how I know. Listen. God's in the people business, and so we need to be in the people business. You say, well, how do you know God's in the people business? Because I remember what Jesus said. Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh, right? So Jesus came, he gathered disciples up and said, guys, listen, you need to know something. I'm going to tell you something right now so you don't ever have to wonder about it anymore. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, you want to know why I'm here? You want to know I left the glory and the splendor and the majesty of heaven to come to this place? You want to know why I did? I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And let me ask you something. What was lost? Was there a lost building he was looking for? Was there a lost budget? Was there a lost program? Was there a lost committee meeting he was looking for? No, 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 no. He was looking for lost people. He shed his blood on the cross that we sang about a while ago for lost people. God's in the people business. He created people. He loves people. The pinnacle of his creation. He loves us and he cares for us. Jesus came for us and shed his blood for people. And so God's in the people business. You and I also ought to be in the people business. Now, let's get even more specific let's narrow this down even further what about the people business what kind of people should involve, be involved in this good works we're talking about well you start reading the bible folks i'm just going to tell you you start reading this bible from genesis to revelation it is inescapable it is undeniable that god has a special affinity for a special affection for the poor the suffering, the hurting, the outcast, the downtrodden. I'm talking about it is from Genesis to Revelation. Over and over and over again, you see from the prophets to Jesus himself to the writers of the epistle. You, it's, you, you can't deny it. I'll share a few passages with you. And what I want you to know is what I'm going to share, this is just a small sampling. I could have used a bazillion, seemingly, verses. But what I'm going to share with you is not some isolated passages I had to really look real hard for to find. Oh, no, no. Easy examples of many passages just like this. Psalm 82.3, the psalmist said, Defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless. 
maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. I want to tell you all something. I used to practice law for four years in Hattiesburg in another lifetime. And I can tell you, if you're poor and you get hauled into court and you don't have representation, you're doomed. You're history. 99 out of 100 times or more, you're going to lose. Okay? That's just the nature of our system. And yet, what does the psalmist say? Christian, God follower, defend the cause of the weak and fathers. Maintain the rights. Don't give them rights they don't have. Don't, but maintain. Make sure those rights that they have are maintained in your society. Proverbs 14, 31 says, He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. This is interesting. I don't know about you. I'm so glad God saved me. I'm just, I'm absolutely astonished, frankly, because you don't know, but I know, my wife knows a little bit, but the depths of my own sin is horrendous, okay? And God saved somebody like me. It's kind of ridiculous. But he did, and I'm so glad. So you know what? As a result of that, I seek to, a lot of times, sometimes the flesh gets in the way, but I want to honor him. You know what I mean? I, wanna, I don't want to dishonor my God. Because he loves me, he cares for me, he's provided for me, he's blessed me in so many ways. So how can I honor God? I don't have to wonder. It says right here, Proverbs 14, 30, whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. You know what I think that means? When we make fun of the poor, when we put down the poor, when we ridicule the poor, and we spend all our time blaming the poor for being poor, we're showing, this is a very strong language, I think, we're showing contempt for their maker. Who is God? God, you didn't know what you were doing. You're ridiculous. What are you thinking, God? Showing contempt for the maker of, of all people. And church, I want to encourage this because I know how I am, and y'all probably like me. I, I, you know, I'm, let's just be frank. I'm a middle-aged man in Mississippi. I, I'm pretty conservative, I just am, and most of my beliefs, if you were to, I won't get into all of them here, of course, but if you were to, you know, quiz me on all my beliefs, political, social, and otherwise, I'm a pretty conservative, middle-aged man in Mississippi, okay? I just am, okay? And you know, the, the, the challenge that brings to me sometimes is, I want to spend all my time blaming the poor for being poor. Oh, I get it. I, so before you protest, I get it. We don't want to enable people to be poor. I, we do have to talk about personal responsibility. I talk about it all the time. Absolutely. We don't want to encourage people to, to make the same mistakes over and over that they make to put them in a mess, you know, like uh, drugs and alcohol addiction, things like having babies before you get married at a young age. All those things lead to tremendous poverty, and people bring them on themselves a lot of the time, don't they? Come on. You know it's true. And so what we do is we take that to the nth degree, as Christians, I'm not talking about as citizens of the United States, I'm talking about as citizens of the kingdom of God. What we do is we take this to the nth degree and we spend all of our time talking about personal responsibility. We spend all of our time blaming the poor for being poor and we never get around to actually helping the poor. Amen. And what did Jesus say about this? Listen, what did Jesus say? It doesn't matter what I said. We see this theme. I, showed, I gave you some verses from the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament, okay? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25? I was hungry, and you spent two hours debating personal responsibility. I was thirsty, and you blamed me for being thirsty. I was a stranger, and you talked about the dumb mistakes I had made to not have friends. Is that what he said? He said, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. I thought about it this morning as I was at the hotel and walking around and thinking about this passage. It struck me. I said, well, let's go back to Jesus. I said, he has to be always our, our example. You remember the time he fed the 5,000? Okay? And remember, they had followed, all the people had followed him, right, that day. They heard he was going over to the other side of the lake, so they, they run over there and they get there, and it's getting the end of the day. You know, there's no McDonald's around or anything, right, so they're hungry. And you remember what Jesus said? Jesus looked at them and said, well, this is ridiculous. You knew you were coming over here, and you didn't bring a sack lunch. Why didn't you bring a sack lunch? It's all your fault. You knew how far it was. You knew how long it would take. You knew there was no McDonald's. And so you should have brought a sack lunch. And it's all your fault. So go home. Is that what he said? No, you know what Jesus did? He fed them. You remember they came with leprosy? Remember what Jesus said? 
Well, why were you hanging out with another leper? Of course you're going to get leprosy. Everybody knows that it's contagious. Are you crazy? No, no, no. He, 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 he healed them. He blessed them. He loved them. And listen, their lives were changed forever. They just were. They just were. Oh, I know, I know. When he forgave the woman, you know, caught in adultery, I know he told her to go and sin no more. But he also forgave her. He did. Remember what Jesus said? Luke 14, this passage just kills me. Luke 14. Jesus said, all right, guys, listen up. When you give a banquet and invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Y'all, I, I want to tell you why that bothers me so much. Because, see, I've been in church for now almost 50 years. My dad's been a pastor for 50 years. My grandfather, J.C., was a deacon for about 60 years. His father, who I knew, my great-grandfather, Gran, was a deacon for about 50 years. I've been in Baptist churches all my life. I've been a Baptist pastor, and now I do missionary work, okay? I get it. And with all this, you know how many church banquets I've been to? I think the number is 42 billion, all right? And I like church banquets. I do. You get to go. I've been to tons of them. I love them. Yeah, I've had all the chicken, the beans. You know, I get that. You, you, you get to do all that. You honor the, 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 maybe you have a banquet. I mean, where you honor the people who volunteer in your church. That's great. That is awesome. You, maybe, sometimes you have a banquet to do a fundraiser if you're building a church or something. You have a big uh, a, a fundraiser. You do all of that. And that's, listen, there's not a thing wrong with that. But you know what it struck me one day? All these years I've been going to banquets. You know the one banquet I hadn't been to? The kind Jesus said to have. Isn't that strange? We are the oddest creatures, Christians. We really are. How could we have every banquet except the one that he said to have? And, and see, he wasn't speaking metaphorically here. This was not some allegory he was in the middle of. He was saying, when you give a banquet, look it up, Luke 14. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And I don't know how I missed this all my years in ministry. Why have I never had a banquet for the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind? I just missed it. But that's what he said. Well, you got the Old Testament, you got Jesus, then we move into James. But now, if you don't like his toes, te toes stepping on, don't read James, okay? He does not mince words. He's just very blunt and very plain, right? In James chapter 1, verse 27, James said, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Ooh, you hear that? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. I read and I thought, oh, I need to know about because I'm a religious person. Y'all are too. I'm a religious person. I just gave you all my reasons I'm so religious. All right, been in church all my life. I give my finances, my time, my effort, my energy. I, pray. I am a definition of a religious person. I'm glad of that. Absolutely. Okay? And I mean that in, in every positive sense of that term religious. I'm a, and you are too. If you come back tonight, you'll be really religious. Okay? I'll look for you. So we're religious people, okay? And we're giving our, and, and, and man, you're, you're the backbone of this community, of this church. I, that's why I love being here, okay? Because I love people like you. And man, Here's the deal. We're religious people. We're giving time, effort, and energy, and our finances, right, to our religion, which is Christianity. We are. But it struck me one day, what if I'm doing all this religious activity and giving of my financial resources, and God doesn't care anything about it? Wouldn't that be crazy? I mean, that would be the most absurd thing ever. If I do all of this religious activity, going to meetings and being on committees, and, get, and God doesn't care anything about it. I mean, would that not be the craziest thing ever? So I go back to James 1. He tells me what God's interested in. Religion that he accepts. Here it is. Not the word I accept or the Southern Baptist Convention or your grandpa accepted or daddy or the chairman of this committee accepts. None of that matters. Okay? Religion that God accepts. Here it is. Look after orphans and widows in their distress. Amen. But wait a minute. No. It says look after widows and orphans. But what? No. It says look after orphans. But, it, but I, no. It says to look after widows and orphans in their distress. Wow. You see, we got something to do, church. Amen. We got something to do. It's to do good works for his glory and for the benefit of others, for the poor, the suffering, the downtrodden, the needy. You cannot escape it. It's in the scriptures. Now, we can choose not to do that, okay, because we can, because we're, you know, 
freedom-loving people and we can do what we want to do. That's just called disobedience. It's just disobedience. And so, and, and, and I want to say this before we move to this next part of the message. You know what I found in my own life? This is, this, it took me years to figure this out. I have found, and you've probably found it in your own, you know when you're doing something that qualifies as good works? Helping that neighbor. You know, working with people who are struggling or suffering. Some of that. You know how you feel good about that? You just a sense of satisfaction. You want to know why? Because you were doing what you were created to do. Of course you feel good about it. And those times when I get away from serving others, it's all about me and what I want, what I want to do, and I'm all out mad and out of sorts and out of whack and make everybody else upset, right? You know why? Because I'm not doing what I was created to do. So if you want to experience some joy in your life, you want to experience excitement, you want to experience a sense of satisfaction and meaning and purpose in your life, then do what you were created to do. Of course you're going to find that meaning. Of course it's going to be marvelous. Well, there'll be challenges and difficulties. But that sense of when you lay your head down on the pillow at night, God, I, I, you know, not bright. God, I, I believe I honored you today. Amen. I did what you created me to do. Thank you for those opportunities that you gave me. And that's the joy. That's the purpose that we find in our lives. Okay. Now, let, let's draw some practical application. What is that going to look like? Okay. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. It looked like different for different people. Depends on where you live, where you're from, what your gifts are, your education, your experiences, your knowledge, your everything. It just depends on who you are, how God wired you. Okay? It doesn't have to all be the same. What it is for me isn't necessarily what it is for you. But I could give you some examples of what I've seen and the blessings that come out of that. This past Friday, two days ago, uh, I was invited to go to the last day of vacation Bible school at a church in Ridgeland where I had served for a year as an interim pastor. And uh, so it's been months later. They've got a new pastor. They're doing great. But they were having vacation Bible school. The, the missions pastor called me and said, Stan, would you come Friday to our last morning session? He said, here's what I need. You know, I do work in Haiti like you guys do work great with HMM. Please keep working them. Keep, please keep doing that work. All right. I do work in Haiti. We have two different locations. And, and so um, they decided they wanted to build a house. We build houses. one of the things we do for people living in mud huts. And they decided they'd raise 5,500. They would put, you know, pit the boys against the girls. If you want to raise money at VBS, that's how you do it, right? Pit the boys against the girls, have a little competition. You know, and that's a lot of money, though, for these kids. It's a lot of money. And they were trying to raise $5,500 in their little VBS offering to build a family living in a mud hut, a brand new house. Well, I get there Friday, and guess what had happened? These kids, they made a presentation to me. They had not only raised that, but one of, like Wednesday or Thursday, one of the dads that showed up to drop the kid off saw what was going on. He pledged to match it, and I received an amount not only build two houses for people who live in mud huts, but there was extra money to build beds for those who will be living there and to paint one of the schools. I was overwhelmed. I was just blown away. And all of a sudden, those kids were taught and got to be a part of something, of doing good works in the name of God for the benefit and, uh, of others. What an incredible experience that was. And over the next few weeks, we'll be building those houses. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you do good works? I remember I was in Haiti uh, some time ago, probably eight or nine months ago. I was there last week, and I go about once a month. But I was walking along, and, and uh, we have some schools where we sponsor kids. And, and, and this particular day, I was with our missionary who lives there full time. His name is Terry. And we were building a house. And at the same time, there was a pastor's conference going on at the church. Well, we're building a moving block, and I got tired of moving block, to tell the truth. I said, oh, we better go check on the pastor's conference. And so, so I got him, and we started walking down this dirt road, going over to where the, the church was or the pastor's conference. And as we were walking, Terry and I, this little girl, she looked to be about eight or so, started walking beside us. She had a bucket in her hand. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, Terry, why isn't she in school? I knew why. I just wanted to hear him say it. He said, well, she can't afford to go to school. I said, well, where's she going? I knew where she was going, but I wanted to hear him say it. He said, well, she's taking her bucket, and she's going right down the road. She's going to walk a mile down the river, and she's going to fill that bucket up with water. And you do the math, and it's about 45 pounds or so. She's going to put that on her head, and she's going to walk back up there. Now, she'll do it again later in the afternoon, and she'll do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. 
And at that time, you see, we have a sponsorship program where we sponsor these kids in school for like $37 a month. My wife and I were not sponsoring a kid at that time. And I looked at her, and I remember thinking, God, as long as you give me breath, this girl's going to go to school. We're going to sponsor her. Because, see, I knew what would happen. Uh, she would grow up, and she won't be able to read, and she won't be able to write. And you see, if you can't read or write, here's what happens, y'all. If you have no education, your view of life is very narrow. But all of a sudden, when you can read and write, the world begins to open up. And there are possibilities, and you begin to understand better. I thought, God, it's just not right. My kids have been in incredible schools. They're all in college right now, and they'll graduate. And, and, and she can't even learn to read and write. It's not right. It's not okay. It's not okay that Juicemith is her name, that all she's going to do is go and get water back and forth and about 13 start getting pregnant. God, you have more for her. And so we began sponsoring her. And you know, every time I go now, guess where I go to the school? I see Juicemith. And she's got the uniform. And she's in school. And she's learning to read. And she's learning to write. And by the way, the house that I left because I was tired of doing the block, that was her parents' house. That was her house. She got a house. She's in school, and she's going to the church, which is right there, and the clinic is just right down the road. She has access to that. God's people. God's people making a difference. I, there's, a, there's a little village called Matthias. You, you guys go to Ansel Pete. You all heard of Ansel Pete, of course. Uh, we're probably, as a crow flies, where our location is probably not 40, 50 miles. It was like a seven-hour drive from Ansel Pete. And so one day I was there, and we decided to go to this remote village. I'm talking about it's in the middle of nowhere. And so uh, we had audio Bibles we were handing out. Because you know what we begin to think? People need God's Word, don't they? Wouldn't you agree? People, I don't care what country they're in, they need God's Word. But here's the problem. We thought, well, what if we give these people a Bible they can't read? It will do them no good. I'm sorry, it just won't. I thought, but what if we get them an audio Bible and they could hear it? But then we thought, yeah, but... If it's in English, they don't understand English. What good's that go to? So this young man from Birmingham, you know what? He came back to the States. He found audio Bible in Haitian Creole. But then we had one more problem. What are they going to do when the battery runs out? It's not like, you know, Walmart next door. <laughs> They're in the middle of nowhere. You know what he found one? He found one that's in Haitian Creole, uh, that, that's in Haitian Creole, that's audio, and solar powered. And so we had these, and so we began distributing the Bibles. And I'll never forget, we're out there one day, and we walk up to this man, and, you know, out, way out in the middle of nowhere, they've heard of Jesus, okay? They hadn't heard of Adam or Eve or Noah or Abraham, Peter and John. They didn't heard any of those. They've heard of Jesus, usually. So I walked up to this guy. We had a little group, and we had our audio Bibles, and we began to talk. I said, well, listen, do you know Jesus? He said, no, I don't really know Jesus. I said, well, could I tell you about Jesus? He said, oh, yeah, tell me about Jesus. And so I went through the gospel. I told him that there's a God, and he created us. He loves us very much. We're separated because of sin in our lives. And I, and, and, but, but God sent Jesus. I went through the whole nine yards of the whole gospel. And at the end, I shared with him that the Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can call him in prayer. And I'd love to lead you in that prayer, and you can put your faith in this God who loves you and his son, Jesus. He said, I would like to do that. So I lead this guy in a prayer of salvation. Fine. Well, I'm standing. He's right there. I'm standing here. I didn't realize it, but during this process, a young Haitian lady wearing a yellow shirt had walked up, and she was standing about five feet away and had been listening. We had a translator. She had been listening to this gospel presentation the whole time. And, folks, I kid you not, as soon as he says this prayer, when he said amen, she went emphatically stepped forward, and she said, I want to know about Jesus too. I said, well, you know, we're running late on time. And, no, I didn't say that. I said, yes, let me tell you about him. And we got to share the gospel with her. And she put her faith in Jesus. Now, what brought that about? Because some Christian young man said, you know what? It's not okay that these folks don't know about Jesus. You know, I know it's going to be hard. I know they don't speak English. I know they don't have any batteries. I know they can't read. But I'm going to do whatever I need to do. And he's a young man who just had his first job. He didn't have a lot of money. Okay, He went out and located these audio Bibles, bought thousands of dollars worth of them, and sent them down there. Amen. Why? He's doing good. That's what he was created to do. I'll tell you one more. Her name is Millie. She went right not far from here at Mississippi State. She just graduated this last May. Her name's Millie, Millie Adams. And Millie had been going to Haiti with us a bunch of times. And, uh, you know, over the last two years, there have been severe drought down there. And we've seen massive hunger, people starving. And you know what? Millie, as a follower of Jesus Christ, seeing that hunger, she just wasn't okay with that. 
She said, oh, they're starving. That's no big deal. It, it was a big deal for her, and it is a big deal. But she's a college student, right? What's she going to do? Well, Millie, the, we have a thing called Plumpy Nut. Plumpy Nut is a little, uh, it's like uh, peanut butter-based little bars that you can buy. It's just chock full of, uh, of calories and nutrients. And, and organizations produce this for people who are starving. You know what Millie did right here in Starkville? She went on Facebook and said, you know what? There are people starving that I know, that I've met in Haiti. And we want to, we want to have Plumpy Nut. Millie Adams, a college girl, raised $7,000. And we went down, we bought the Plumpy Nut, and you know what's been happening? We've been giving Plumpy Nut to starving children and their families. Why? Why? Because that's what God created us to do, y'all. You know, you can't imagine. Dude. I was there. I was there the day we went back after the money gone down there, and we bought the Plumpy Nut, and it all came boxes full of Plumpy Nut, and Millie was there, and she got to see and hold it and touch it and hand that out. You think that didn't mean something to her? You think that didn't mean something to her? So many opportunities. You say, Stan, well, that's great. I mean, we do work in Haiti, but I, I will tell you this. You know, we have challenges here in Mississippi. Do you know that? There's hunger. Believe it or not, there's hunger people in Mississippi. There's poverty in Mississippi. In our organization, But God Ministries, we're about to launch in about 30 days, we'll be announcing a new work in the Mississippi Delta because there's hunger and there's poor educational standards and all kinds of things going on right there. And we're so excited to be able to launch that so that, you know what, this is our state, isn't it? Not to quote Mississippi State, but this is, as, 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 as people, as citizens, this is our state. This is where we live. This is where we're from. And it's been our dream to, to go to a place like Haiti and learn some principles of how to, how to interact with people, build sustainable communities, not make people dependent on us, but to build sustainable communities, and then to come back one day and do that right here in our state. Y'all know where Clarksdale is over on the, on the, in the Delta? Just about 12 miles northeast of there, a little town called Jonestown. We're going to be launching a new work there and, and working in that sustainable community right there. And I'm so excited. Now, here's what I want, I want to say to you as we close out. We've got to go. I know. We've got to go. Here's the thing. Three things I've learned. Here's the first one I want to leave with you. The first one I've learned is over these years is I'm not a cat, a C-A-T. Do you know that? I'm not a cat. You say, well, that's obvious. And no, well, you know, they say cats have nine lives, right? Well, guess what? I got one shot at this thing called life. You've got one shot at this thing called life. And you know what? The, the only fear I have, or one of the primary fears I have in life, is coming to the end of my life, being on my deathbed, and realizing I blew it. Saying, God, I didn't exercise faith and courage. I didn't launch out. I just, I played it safe my whole life, and I was never willing to take a chance. I was never willing to be obedient. I never exercised more faith and more courage to be obedient to what you called me to do. And I blew it. I got one shot at this thing called life, and it's ticking away. Amen. It's ticking away. What am I doing? To honor God, that's the first thing. I'm not a cat. The second thing is a question that has been going through my mind for some time now, and I want to ask you the question. Here it is. Is anyone's life better or different because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? I want to ask you that. Is anyone's life better or different because you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Is there one? Oh, I don't mean just your immediate family. Unbelievers do that, right? Is there anyone's life that's better or different because you and I are... They say, you know what? My life has been blessed because that follower of Jesus, Stan, came along and he invested in my life and he blessed me and he helped me and he, and he, and he helped me to move forward in my life. I mean, could we call people up? Could they call about you and give, walk up on this platform and give testimony that because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, their life is different. Their life is better. Come on, isn't there just one? Couldn't there be one? And the third thing I leave you with is a song that I heard some time ago. It was this contemporary Christian song. It came on. You may have heard it. And in the song, the guy starts out telling a story. And he said, I woke up this morning and I thought about all the poverty in this world. I thought about all the poverty and all the hopelessness and all the sickness and all the terror. I thought about all the bad things that are going on. It made me angry. And he said, I looked up into heaven and I took my fist. I shook my fist at God. And I said, God, why don't you do something? And God said, I did. I created you. Amen. You see, we can sit around cursing the darkness and we can sit around talking about all the bad people that are ruining our country and everything else. We can do that and be accurate, right? Or we can be obedient. 
we can take the faith and the love and the mercy that has been given to us. And, and here's the last thing. What, what do you have, listen, what do you have to do? What do you have to do to do good works in the name of you? You've got to go to Haiti, right? No, you should, but you don't have to go to Haiti, all right? There are probably people next door to you, I don't know, and maybe she's going through a terrible divorce and she has no idea how she's going to pay the light bill this month and you've got more money than you can count. Or, or, or maybe there's, there's somebody at the school where your kid goes and you know they don't have anything and they need to be blessed and they need to be loved. Maybe there's somebody down at the hospital who's struggling. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's through your church. And here's the thing. I know you're a loving church, a caring church, and I want to commend you to keep doing that. But listen, if you hadn't quite gotten the game, you say, well, Stan, I don't know what to do. Listen to me. God created you a certain way, all right? He created you. He has, he has blessed you. I'm telling you, I'm looking in a room of blessed people because he's given you an education. He's given you financial resources. He's given you a mind to process information. He's given you a church to be a part of. He's given you a personality. And listen, how he has made you use that. If you've got education as a teacher, good. Go teach somebody who's ignorant. All right? If he's given you uh, the gift of making money, go help somebody who's desperately poor. If he's given you a, a, a whatever gift it is, however he's made you. We have people that go with us. We have engineers that go and provide water for people who have no water. We have uh, uh, medical people who go and work at our clinics. Listen, God's blessed you. you. You don't have to make something up. However he's used you, if he's used you to do music, go do music. Whatever he's called you to do, use that for his glory and for the benefit of others. And I want to tell you something. Your life will never be the same. The joy, the meaning, and the purpose that will just penetrate your heart. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And it doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. One of my favorite people, his name is John. And not too long ago, I was in Haiti with him for his fifth trip, and he was 89. Amen. And if you can't go somewhere, you can fund somebody else to go. Or you can work at home. You can work in your church. There's nothing like it. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you would use people like us for your glory, for your benefit. Thank you for the opportunities to, to, to God to do good works in your name. Father, I thank you how it blesses us when we are obedient to you and how you give us purpose and meaning and significance in our lives through serving you. Oh, Father, I pray that you would forgive us, those that you saved a long time ago, and those of us who have not done what you created us to do, which is to do good works in your name. Father, please forgive our apathy. Please forgive our indifference. Give us vision. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear opportunities all around us this week to do good works in your name. What a great and holy God you are. We love you and we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have our time of commitment right now, and that's just your opportunity to make some decision public that maybe God's been placing on your heart. Maybe like the guy I saw that day in Haiti, maybe it's to put your faith in Jesus Christ for the very first time, or maybe it's to come and, and, and unite with this church. I'm going to tell you something. If I lived in this community, I'd want to come to this church, a church that's busy doing the Lord's work. I'd want to be a part of this church. And so if you've been looking for a church home, why not come and, and unite today? Or listen, maybe you're wondering, God, what do you want me to do? The first step in that, listen, the first step is to say, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but the answer is yes. The answer is yes before you even tell me the details. I'm going to be obedient to you. Maybe you want to come and, and, and offer that prayer. Whatever decision you need to make, this is the time to respond. Why don't you come as we stand and we sing?